Amen. That's excellent. He sang that in chapel the other day. I'm glad he sang it in church. I appreciate what Matt does to help us. Galatians chapter 6. We, our theme this year is taken from this chapter, from verse 10, uh, where Scripture tells us that as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And we said this morning that uh, there's a needful clarification. We need to understand uh, under no un- with no uncertain terms that you cannot work your way to heaven, right. that your good works don't score you brownie points with God. We, are, we, ought to, we ought to do good because we're children of God. We also said this morning that there is an unlimited inclusion. And by that, we elaborated on the, on the truth that we're to do good to all men, not just those uh, who do good to us, not just those with whom we agree, uh, not just those uh, that we think are worthy of us doing good to them, but we're to do good uh, to all men. And then we reminded ourselves this morning that there are limitless opportunities. Uh, as we, ought to, we ought to be opportunistic when it comes to this matter of doing good, of being kind, of helping people, loving people. And then finally, uh, we said there are definitive priorities. And we ended the message this morning by saying, uh, especially those who are of the household of faith. And it begins here. It begins in this house. It begins in your house. Uh, You ought not be a better Christian anywhere than you are at home. Nowhere. That that ought to be where your Christianity is prominently displayed and manifested. And then within the church, we we can't be good enough out there to offset things if we don't love each other. It starts here. Well, tonight we're going to look at this chapter. And, uh, you know, it's one thing thing to say, well, let's do good. And it's another thing to know how we go about doing good. And I believe the answers are given us uh, here in this passage of Scripture. So we're going to uh, begin in verse number 1, Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 1. Brethren, he's talking to save people. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, we have taught and preached messages on restoration, and that's not exactly what we're trying to accomplish this evening. But the first thing I jotted down, if I'm going to do good, I need to do good with the right spirit, with the right spirit with the right spirit. A a good thing that all of us could work at in 2022 is restoration. If you're going to stare at me, I'm going to stare at you. All right. That, that would be a good thing. Would it not? If we just made up our minds that, Hey, we want to be involved this coming year and every year beyond, we want to be involved in restoration, spiritual restoration. Are we not all very happy this evening that our God is into recycling and not disposal? I'm I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that God doesn't give up on us and he doesn't throw us away. And God always wants us to be restored. The truth is, if God threw us away when we messed up, this would be an empty room this evening. There wouldn't be anyone here this evening if God, whenever we messed up, made a mistake, sinned, fell, were overtaken in a fault, if God just got rid of us at that point, there would be no one here. You know why? Because we all struggle. Every one of us struggle. And too often in Christianity, and unfortunately too often in churches, we tend to just mark people off because they they, uh, they stumble or they fall, or we're, we're especially, it's especially dangerous when we, we take certain sins and we say, okay, they're done. Well, the truth of the matter is, your sin is no better than my sin and mine no better than yours. And everyone can be restored. 
the subject of restoration is an entirely different message, and we're not going to spend a lot of time in that. But, but a critical part of restoration, according to Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 1, is that we restore people with the right spirit. Why do you do good? What is your attitude when, when you come in contact with someone who has fallen, someone who's been overtaken in a fault, and maybe you go about, you go about trying to restore them? What is your spirit when you do that? We've got to have the right spirit. It's good. It's good work to love others. It's good work to pick up a fallen brethren. It's good work to help them in restoration. But in this verse, God addresses not only our responsibility to restore, but he addresses the spirit we should manifest when we do. How, how, do, we, how do we do good? Well, we, we do it with the right spirit, number two. He says we do it with meekness with meekness. It's not enough just to do good, but we ought to do good with the right spirit. And a part of the right spirit would be the spirit of meekness. Look at verse one again. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. Notice what it says here. In the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The word meekness there means gentleness, gentleness or or mildness. One person said meekness is actually strength under control. We're to restore in the spirit of meekness. So as we look to 2022 and as we consider opportunities that all of us will have to do good, let's be sure that our spirit is right when we do. That we don't get involved in this to make us look good or to gain favor with God, or to appear better than others, not because, hey, not even because we feel sorry for people in need, but that we do good because that's what people of God are supposed to do. Is there a need? Absolutely there's a need. Are there people hurting? Everywhere you go, all around us, is that to be our motivation? No, our motivation is, we'll see this at the end of the message, but our motivation is Christ. That's our motivation. And we do what we do as ambassadors for Christ, and we do what we do with a spirit of meekness. He says in verse 3, notice this, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. I stumbled onto a quote this afternoon. I want to give it to you. It was by Tozer. And Tozer said, The meek man is not a human mouse afflicted with a sense of his own inferiority. Rather, he may be in his moral life as bold as a lion and as strong as Samson. But he has stopped being fooled about himself. He has accepted God's estimate of his own life. He knows he is as weak and helpless as, de as God declared him to be, but paradoxically. He knows at the same time that he is in the sight of God of more importance than angels. In himself, nothing. In God, everything. That is his motto. That is meekness. It is understanding. It is understanding that, that I'm no better than anyone else. No one. Hey, by the way, no one's any better than you. And we can rejoice tonight that at the foot of the cross, the ground is perfectly level. And we understand as we go about doing good that tomorrow it could be us as, as the one that's in need. And that as we work to help, love, and encourage, we do so with a meek spirit. We do it with the right spirit. We do it with meekness. How do, you, how do we do good? Number three, we do it with responsibility. We understand we have a responsibility. Look, if you would, at verse number two. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So, so God has placed this upon us, okay? We cannot ignore it. If there were no church theme for 2022, you would still be responsible. Responsible to do good. We can't ignore it. We can't turn our back to it. We cannot just pretend that it is, isn't there. But we are to accept that responsibility if we are going to be obedient as believers. 
See, you may have sat here this morning, you may have thought to yourself, well, that's good. That's good for these other people. No, it's you. It's you. You're responsible. Well, that's good for the pastor. I certainly hope he gets paid to do good. No, it's, it's for all of us. We have, been given, we have been given a mandate by God. Isn't it funny how prone we are to follow mandates by Fauci? We've been given a mandate by God, and the mandate is this. You have a personal responsibility to bear the burdens of others around you. It's your responsibility. And we, we, hey, you, you shirk it if you want to, but you cannot ignore it. Uh, I think about Cain and Abel. And the question was asked, well, am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Yes, you are. You have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to you. You have a responsibility to me. We are to bear one another's burdens or we cannot fulfill the law of Christ. Right? So it's our responsibility. You put that magnet on your refrigerator, I hope it's, it's used of God as a reminder in your life. But if you have no magnet, you still have a responsibility. You can like the theme, you can dislike the theme, but whether you like the theme or not has nothing to do with your responsibility. God has laid this upon every one of our shoulders. Now I promise you there is someone sitting in this room tonight or maybe watching by way of live stream, whose mindset is, well, I certainly hope someone does good to me. That's just the way it is. Well, I hope they're listening because, hey, I sure need someone to bear my burden. You missed the whole train. No, what we need to understand tonight that is as saved, born-again people, we have a responsibility to bear one another's burdens. Wonderful story in Scripture. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus told a lawyer, he said, you ought to love your neighbors yourself. And the lawyer, trying to trip up the Savior, said, well, who's my neighbor? He said, well, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about a traveler who went from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was beaten and robbed and left for dead on the side of the road. He said a priest happened to come by, and he saw the man in need and passed by on the other side. A Levite came along. He saw the man in need as well, and he passed by on the other side. But there was a certain Samaritan. You know what Samaritans were. They were hated people. They were were referred to as being half-breed people. They were Samaritans. They were looked down upon. But here's what the Bible says about the certain Samaritan. Here's what the Scripture says. It says, he came to him. He came to him. He bound up his wounds. He anointed him with oil. He set him on his beast and took him to the inn. He paid his bills. He said, take care of him. And if this isn't enough, when I come back through, I'll pay the rest. You know what he did? He done good. That's what he did. And you may be, you may be a priest or a Levite. And you may make the decision that you're just going to pass by, but I'm here to tell you that if you choose to do that, you are shirking your God-given responsibility. But it doesn't end there. Notice what the Bible says in verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. What does this mean? It means I have a dual responsibility, right? Does anybody listen? I have a dual responsibility. I have a responsibility to bear the burdens of others while at the same time, simultaneously, I'm bearing my own burden. I got ahead of myself. But if you're sitting here tonight thinking, boy, I hope somebody catches this and they help me with my burden, you have missed it. You have missed it. You have missed it. You, you, you totally misunderstood. You totally have disregarded the Scripture. And you will not, you cannot fulfill the law of Christ. I have to accept the responsibility. You know what? Hey, I got problems. All God's children got problems. 
All right? Things don't always go my way, and I go through tough times just like you do, and I have to, you know what I have to do sometimes? I have to man up. I just have to man up. And i got to beg God for grace and strength and power and know that I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, but I cannot become so focused on my, my burden. I don't, I don't care who you are, what you're going through tonight, and a lot of you are going through a lot. But you cannot, because you have a lot on you, you cannot take a pass on ignoring the burdens of others. God holds you and I responsible. How many of you have noticed this? That even when things seem so bad in your own life, that when you find yourself investing in the lives of others and bearing their burdens, it seems like yours kind of diminish. Amen. Have you seen that? I've seen that in my life. That when I, when I, man, I, I, can, I, can have a, I can have the weight of the world on my shoulders and, and I, can, I can become vested in someone else's trial and in their burden. And all of a sudden, I even forget sometimes. I even forget that I have a problem. So if we're going to do good, we've got to be responsible. All right? What is our responsibility? First of all, it's to bear our own burden. We, we don't get a pass. Secondly, it's to bear one another's burdens. We're to, do, we're to do good with responsibility. We're to do good with gratitude. With gratitude. Look at verse number 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now, the literal application of this is that those who invest in us spiritually should be cared for. And I, and I would testify tonight and with, with a heart of gratitude for how, for these many years, the church has taken care of, of me and my family. I am extremely, extremely, extremely grateful. That is a little, he's, if they, if, if, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth, in all good things. So when we have next Sunday, Reno Likens is going to be here, and uh, we'll encourage you to put something in the box as a, a love gift to Brother Reno. Why, why would I do that? Because that verse right there tells me I am to do that. All right? Why, why would I do that? Because I'm grateful that this man is going to take time away from his wife and his church. He's not a pastor, but he, he's a faithful uh, member uh, there in Louisville, that he's going to take time away from his wife and his church to come. I'm grateful for that. So out of a heart of gratitude, uh, back, in the, back in the old days, one of our church members, they may be, I'm not sure if they're here tonight, but uh, I threw out that line about the bird of paradise, and one of our younger couples sent me a text and said, why don't you use illustrations from like this century? They're bitter people. <laughs> and, uh, and, and they said, we Googled bird of paradise. That is like ancient. I said, that was my heyday. <laughs> right? I said, you need to Google the song. How many of you know the song? <laughs> it's a great hymn. Uh there, I forgot where I was going again. <laughs> I think I'm in the grocery store. Um, but but we, we, gratitude causes me to, to want to take care. Do you know, what we ought, you know why we ought to do good? Because we are so grateful Amen. for what God has done in our lives. I'll never forget Eddie Goddard when he was alive and preaching our missions conferences. He would oftentimes say something like this. It's much, it's much better to be the one who is able to give than to be the one who needs to be given to. That's a great thought, isn't it? That what ought to happen, hey, how many of you are glad you're saved? Raise your hand, you're glad you're saved. Are you grateful? You know, if you're grateful that you're saved, it ought to provoke you to do what you can to invest in other people. We do it with gratitude. We are grateful that we've heard the gospel. Hey, we're grateful. If, if, if I cross paths with someone who's in a financial need and I have the wherewithal, if I have any extra money in my pocket and I'm able to, uh, 
to, to help someone. We were in a restaurant several months ago, several months ago. And there was a family in this restaurant, and uh, they were obviously, their child had, had cancer. It was very obvious. And we got ready to leave, and I went over to their table, and I said, are you guys local? And they said, no. And I, I, I took a little piece of money and laid it on the table. I said, look, let me, let me buy your supper tonight. Amen. And I said, here's, here's our track, and this is my contact information. And while you're here, if there's anything that our church can do to help you, please, please let us know. Amen. You know, I was glad that, don't take this wrong, I was glad that I wasn't in their shoes, yeah. that my child didn't have cancer that I was not in a foreign city somewhere taking a break from a hospital routine to go grab a bite to eat. And and stuff like that, doesn't that move you? That moved me. And and so it it was gratitude in my heart that in that particular instance provoked me to do what I could do. Some... She's probably watching. One of our church members gave me some money for my birthday at Christmas and said, I heard you tell a story one time about um, you, had, you had stopped at a gas station. You were out of gas. You didn't have any money. And you had to call someone at the church to come. And I was up in Mebane. And I think Brother Ken came up and, and brought me uh, some money so I could get some gas. I was dead in the water, man. I was stranded. And, and she said, she said, uh, I'm going to give you this money, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to put this in a secret pocket in your wallet because I don't ever want you to get stuck like that again. Amen. So that night when I saw that family with that child with cancer, I, I pulled my wallet out. I didn't have anything. And then I said, my secret money. <laughs> and I was so thankful that I was able that God, hey, I was glad Somebody in kindness gave that to me, right? And, and, and this dear lady, one of our widow ladies, and she didn't know, she had no idea that I was going to cross someone's path, that at that very moment, I didn't have the wherewithal to help, but, but God had used her to bless me, and the Holy Spirit, I think, brought it to my mind so that I was able to be a blessing to others. What ought to happen tonight is we ought to be so overwhelmed with God's goodness in our lives. That doing good is just the natural outflow. Well, we ought to do good. <clears throat> we ought to do good with gratitude. Back in the Old Testament, they would bring tithes of the harvest to the temple. And today, <clears throat> we take care of those who minister to us. But as we look deeper to the foundation of this, it comes from a heart of gratitude. Uh, Albert Einstein, and Albert Einstein, remember as I read this, was an agnostic. And Einstein said, it is every man's obligation to put back into the world at least the equivalent of what he takes out. I think that's powerful. Here's a man who didn't even believe in the the existence of God. But Einstein said, hey, you know what? We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to do good. How do we do good? Well, we do it with generosity. This passage comes to the subject of sowing and reaping. Look at verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now the truth is, this, this truth is not found in the passage, but it is found in Scripture. Let me give you another reference. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So here's what I think the Scripture says to us. As we try to do good to others, let's let's do it in excess. Let's be generous. I'm not just talking about money, not, not in the least. But, but may God help us to give from our hearts and to give recklessly and to look for needs and meet them. Not assuming that, well, someone else will do it. No, let, let us say, you know what? I just want to spend this year sowing goodness. Just sowing goodness. 
set a goal. I challenge you, set a goal. And on purpose, tomorrow, set a goal. I don't care if it's one time or two times or ten times or a hundred times. But set a goal tomorrow and say, you know what? Today, I want to consciously do good to someone else five times. You know what it'll do? If you'll do that, here's what it'll do. It'll cause you to look for opportunity. And a lot of times, we walk right past opportunity, don't even recognize it. But man, if I'm thinking, hey, I got five times, I got to get five times in today. And, 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 and you're going in a store and a stranger comes and you step back and hold the door for them. That's one. And when you do good, do it generously. Don't, don't be a miser when it comes to doing good. Give, give. Acts 10, 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. We referred to this this morning. Who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Two things that jump out at me in this verse. And that is, first of all, that it was the power of the Holy Ghost that enabled him. And the second thing, why did he do it? He did it because God was with him. That's how he was characterized. Here was a guy who went about doing good. How do we do good? With perseverance. With perseverance. Verse 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We have to commit to it, and it will not always be easy, and it might be met with opposition, and it will not always produce immediate results. That family I gave that little piece of money to that night, you know what? They had all my contact. They never called. They never asked for any more help. They never, they never acknowledged it, never sent a thank you. But that's not why I did it. That's not why you do what you do. And if that is why you do what you do, you won't do what you do very long. No, we, we, we can't grow weary in well-doing, Scripture says. We just, we just continue on, and if we continue on, you know what will happen? God will bless, and we will reap. But you have to persevere. I know people who got burned. How many of you ever got burned? By, by doing good, they got burned. They thought they were helping someone, and they found out they were taken advantage of. Right? And uh, years ago, <coughs> we had a lady call here. I haven't been a pastor very long. And she called here and, and gave me. It's amazing how some people do all their homework. She dropped all the right names. Right? She said, I spent time in Lester Roloff's home. This was a long time ago. I spent time in Roloff's home, and I've been here, and I've been there, and I'm stranded, and I'm in a motel, and uh, we don't, we don't, we don't, we changed how we do this, but, but uh, we went over and paid for her. I think I said, look, we'll, we'll pay for you two nights in the motel. About a month later, she forgets that she's already called us. So she calls with a different story. Same lady. And I finally called the manager at the motel. I said, do you know what's going on? He said, yeah, she's freeloading off churches. Now, I, here's what I got to be careful about. I got to be careful that I don't discount every call that comes in. Because... I have to, I can't be weary in well-doing, right? I, I can't, I can't judge your need based on the last crook's need. And, and I'll just be honest that when you decide in your life, this is going to be my lifestyle, I'm going to spend my life doing good, loving people, helping people, meeting needs, you're going to get hurt. Oh yeah, You're going to get hurt. People are going to take advantage of you. It, 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 I'm just warm. I'm just I'm telling you, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. The truth is, some of the people to, in whom I have invested most have hurt me most. That's just the way it is. Do you know what it's called? It's called ministry. It's called ministry. 
What about Jesus? The people for whom he came to die crucified him. And the people, the 12, in whom he had invested the most betrayed him. And Judas sold him for 30 stinking pieces of silver. But you know what? He did good anyway. You just have to make up your mind. Hey, I'm just going to do good. I, I think there needs to be wisdom about this. Okay? I don't think you should hand money to... Matter of fact, I don't hand money to much of anybody. In my mind, I could see a line forming at the end of the service right down there. No, we don't, we don't do that. Even when we feel impressed for the church to help someone, we don't put money in people's hands. Okay, what, well, what's your need? Well, here's my need. Okay, we'll, we'll contact your landlord. You know why? Because some people have learned the system, and they work it, and that's where they get their, their, their uh, drugs and alcohol money. So you can't just be reckless. You know what I'm saying? you got to have wisdom. Do you believe God would give you wisdom about that? I think he would. Amen. If we're busy about his business, I think he would guide us and direct us. But in, regardless, there are going to be times when you're just going to have to say, hey, I'm doing good regardless. When I get weary, I get tired, I get tired of being burnt, taken advantage of, I'm going to just keep on going. And God said, I'll bless you for that with perseverance. And then the last thing, and I'll be done. We've got to do good, and we've got to do it for Jesus. We just do it for Jesus. Look at verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. When you do good, you don't do it for applause. You, you don't do it for recognition. You don't do it for reciprocation. You don't do it to make yourself look good. But you do it for Christ's sake. Amen. You do it because of what he did for you and what he is doing for you. I'm going to embarrass someone. I didn't ask permission. I was... Um, I think it was last Wednesday, and I was, my truck was down there, and I was going to pull it down, and I came down the steps, and Fran was going out the door with about five trash bags, and I said, let me help you with that. Little did I know what I was getting myself into, and so <clears throat> I took the five trash bags and took them to the dumpster. Well, I got to the dumpster, and uh, it's amazing how... People just missed the dumpster and never clean it up. It was, it was nasty. So I grabbed it. We got a shovel out there. So I grabbed a shovel and I started shoveling the trash up, putting it in the dumpster. And I hear the squeaky noise coming across. No, 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 it wasn't a rat. <laughs> he left just before I got there. I promise you he was there. <laughs> I promise you. Based on what I saw. And uh, Fran was coming back and she had a big... One of those big, are they 50-gallon trash cans? One of those big 50-gallon trash cans. She pulled that out. And I said, where are you getting this stuff from? She said, in the janitor's room. People have been putting their trash in there. And so I, I got the trash out of there and <clears throat> put it in the dumpster. And, and um, I said, is that it? She said, no, one more. Now, the truth of the matter is, Fran had no idea when she did that, I was going to tell you about it. She had no idea I was going to see it. And many of you have done that same kind of stuff and nobody saw you. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Someone did see you. Someone did see you. See, if you do good and I see you, you might make a sermon illustration. But if you do good and Jesus sees you, you lay up treasures in heaven. I wonder how many times people in this room have done things like that around this property and no one knew. No one made a big deal about it. You didn't get a plaque. You didn't get any recognition. 
but there is a God in heaven. And you know what Scripture says? If you give a cup of cold water in my name, I'll take note of that. Now, that's not why we do what we do, right? That's not why we do what we do. We don't do it so that we'll be rewarded. We do it because we've already been blessed. But it's okay that we're going to be rewarded. You ever think about what heaven's going to be like? I think about it sometimes. You see, we think, we think at the judgment seat, guys like Billy Graham or Lee Robertson or Jack Hiles or Lester Roloff or John R. Rice, Curtis Hudson, we think they're going to get all the recognition. I don't think it's going to be that way. The, the scripture says that the judgment seat will be, will be judged for our works. And I think some of, some of the, the big pastors are going to be embarrassed. I said a while ago, the church has been very good over, over these years to take care of my family and I, and I'm very grateful. But the truth is, a lot of what I do that I do good, I get paid. I get paid to do good. There's a lot of people sitting in these pews tonight. And you do good good every day, many times a day, and no one even thanks you. But he knows. He knows. So you just just remind yourself, I'm not doing this for Pastor Finley. I'm I'm not doing this because it's my job. I'm doing this for Jesus. I'm doing this because he has saved me. I'm doing this because he has given me a home in heaven. And I'll promise you, I'll promise you, that when it's all said and done, we're all going to be glad that we did good. Father, I pray you would help us. This theme, I think, is going to change our church. But it's going to require some sacrifice. It's going to require dying to self. It's going to require getting us out of the way. If we're going to do good, we can't act in the flesh. It's going to have to be the Spirit of God working through us. But oh, what a difference we could make. I think this is already true, but maybe over the next 11 months, we could even embellish our reputation and testimony in this community that when people drive by Fellowship Baptist Church on the highway, they say, that's a church that does good. Those are, those are good people who do good. Our heads bowed and eyes are closed. I want you to stand, and here's what I want to ask you tonight. Would you tonight consider, and I know that some of you are not able I want to ask how many of you, don't raise your hand, would, would find a place at the altar or kneel in your seat and really do business with the Lord about this matter? God, I want you to use me to do good. I want you to open my